Welcome everybody for today's lunch talk. Uh, I'm Frédéric Bless and I will be your host. Christiane Eger is Deputy Manager of the EU Energie Sparverband and Manager of the Cleantech Cluster Energy, a network of 250 companies active in sustainable energy and uh, environment. She's Conference Director of the World Sustainable Energy Days. She has developed and led many EU-funded projects. She's a member of the management board of the Austrian R&D platform for the decarbonization of industry. She has developed and implemented numerous promotional activities for energy efficiency and renewable energy sources. And she holds a law degree and a postgraduate degrees in environmental engineering, which makes it, uh, in my view, a very interesting combination to tackle decarbonization problems. Christiane, the floor is yours. Yes, good afternoon. Grüß Gott in the Schweiz. Um, I'm very pleased to join you here. So I um, started uh, with a little bit of <laughs> provocation. Um, if you listen to the debates uh, in many countries and in Europe, it seems I've often heard that people said, well, heating, especially domestic heating, this is the most difficult sector. Wow, I would say, I think <laughs> it should be the easiest compared to industrial decarbonization or the full decarbonization of mobility. I'm not saying it's easy, but so we, we created this slogan saying, is it rocket science? We don't think it's rocket science, but of course you need like for every transition, you need a structured approach. Now, where am I from? Uh, Austria is also a federal country. Um, we only have nine uh, regions, uh, Länder. One of them is Oberösterreich, Upper Austria, and you can see where we are. So if you go, if you take the train from Zurich to Vienna, uh, a big part of the Austrian is, well, a certain part of the Austrian is through Upper Austria, Oberösterreich with the capital of Linz. We are 1.5 million, just to give you orders of magnitude and our region is like Austria. <laughs> it's on the one hand very industrial as we are the industrial heart of the Republic with steel chemical um, machinery, very en energy intensive industry. So the debate about industrial decarbonization is a big one and but that's a different talk than today. But also many people live in small municipalities in rural areas. So maybe not so different from many Swiss um, cantonen. Our organization is uh, the energy agency. So we are the public organization set up by the region, by the Land Oberösterreich to drive the energy transition already in 1991. And I've been there since the beginning. Uh, they created us basically at that time to create, to provide product independent energy advice. Uh, something that is still a critical part of our services. In normal years, we do about 10,000 face to face energy advice uh, sessions, Energieberatungen. Uh, this year, it will be. 15,000. <laughs> so you can imagine with the current situation, the demand for our services has exploded. Unfortunately, not my team that provides the service, but that's quite a normal situation. So despite the fact that the circumstances for this are horrible, but the impact that really now it has arrived in all sectors of society that fossil fuel heating has to go, and has to go quickly is something that we have been talking about decades. So in that sense, um, we live in a very interesting and exciting time. Uh, we also provide a big range of services for companies from, uh, you can see here on the slide, research, which is a small part. Uh, we do training, we offer networking in the context. We run funding programs for the region. We do all kinds of awareness campaigns. At the moment, the campaign Oberösterreich spart Energie, obviously. <laughs> uh, so this we launched last week. So uh, I also saw the campaign from the Swiss, which looked very good to me. Uh, uh, this new campaign, which I think was just recently launched on uh, Energie sparen. Uh, lots of very useful information. Um, I wish I had uh, it had been ready a month ago when I was looking for information. So uh, 
also happy to exchange on that, also how it arrives on the ground. So my organization is kind of the link between the people on the ground, so the homeowners that get advice, the municipality we support with their investment project, the industry, the commercial company, and the policy making um, in the region. So, and Austria being federal, we also have a big say on national policies. And in Austria, of course, national policies means also the implementation and the development of EU policies. So in that sense, we are both uh, hands-on, practical, down to the earth every day, uh, but also involved in policy and research and training. So where are we in terms of the energy transition? So the, all the researchers um, excuse this slide <laughs> because of course these are not 100% respectively of the different sectors. So 84% uh, of our electricity production are from renewables. This is obviously mostly hydro. Um, where we are proud of is the share of uh, renewables and clean uh, solutions in space heating. I will talk about this. Also in manufacturing, 43 is uh, renewables. Um, and of our total primary, we are at the third. And what is maybe surprising often, uh, the biggest share in this is uh, bioenergy, the sustainable use of residues from uh, forestry and from woodworking industry. I also have a slide on that. So these are the key pillars. Um, here you can see the greenhouse gas emissions from buildings in the last uh, 25, last 20 years. And what you can see here, we managed to decrease greenhouse gas emissions from buildings by about 40%. And surprise, surprise, half of this is from energy efficiency and the other half is from the switch to renewable heating. So in a way, in a nutshell, <laughs> this is a big part of um, understanding the energy transition in buildings. Obviously not everywhere this is half-half, but as it is actually from the statistic, this um, turns out to be the case. So the energy efficiency is the improvement in the building envelopes, is the improvements of the, uh, imp uh, in the heat distribution, in all the equipment, and the switch to renewable heating is the focus of today's talk. So uh, where are we now here? Um, so in Upper Austria, uh, over 60% are from, I call it now, clean sources. This is not for the research world, but this is for, if I talk to non-energy people, and you can see about 38 of our dwellings, so Wohnungen und Einfamilienhäuser, are heated with modern bioenergy. About 10% of these 38 are district heating, bioenergy district heating. About 12% are heat pumps. And then we have the big chunk of more or less 100,000 oil and 100,000 gas uh, heated dwellings. So these are obviously at the center of our attention. And then we have a little bit of direct electric, which has been forbidden since a long time, uh, and a tiny sliver of coal. And we do have some district heating that is uh, not from renewables and not from, uh, oh, this is a mistake here, from fossil fuels. So this is not from CHP. So basically, this is our picture and now, uh, a few numbers. So here is the development of the bioenergy market. So you see we have about 65,000 systems. So 1.5 million people in the region. Uh, there are 37 pellets, 28 wood chips, but of course wood chips typically have a much larger installed capacity. And we have about 350 local biomass district heating plants. So these are typically in villages where there was no district heating. So I'm not, I'm not talking about district heating in the big cities, such as Linz, Wels, Steyr, but these are in villages, small towns, where the local farmers cooperative um, built and are operating these uh, district energy plants. So this is something 
um, that is one element of the industry of the uh, heat transition. In terms of heat pumps, unfortunately, I don't have this good market data uh, for heat pumps for upper Austria, but this is Austria. So for you, this doesn't make a big difference. And you can see we have a longer history. In the 2000s, we had a kind of down. Uh, this was due to the fact that the early heat pumps often were not of wonderful quality, to say it in a friendly way. And then so uh, 90s, but then of course we had a steady increase. Uh, and of course now in these years. Um, so this is number of pumps. So obviously the domestic sector is dominant. Uh, we also uh, see that the number for um, hot water, uh, uh, has not increased as much as the number for heating, not surprisingly. Now, uh, how did we get there? So what is our policy approach? Uh, and uh, here is what I call it. So it's our uh, energy strategy. Uh, carrot sticks, tambourines, and a skateboard. So the donkey is the symbol here for, you know, um, someone who does, doesn't want to change anything. So basically everyone. Um, uh, in his, her daily life, it's usually more, if you don't have a lot of impetus from the outside, you continue doing uh, what you used to do. If there are no other information coming in or if you are uh, in a professional situation or if you are, of course, above the average interested person. But very often you find this donkey type of persons, organizations, companies, let's just do it. It worked pretty well in the past. And we use um, the carrot. I think that's not hard to guess. The financial incentives um, to make people keen and interested. We use the stick, which is the regulatory, the legal uh, framework. And we do have a very, very comprehensive legislative framework um, based and it's in the hands of the region. So in Austria, uh, building legislation is regional and we implement also the European Buildings Directive. Uh, so this is, um, uh, a key element, obviously. But then these two things, everyone has them. I think it's quite a normal. But then we have the tambourine. The tambourine is information, awareness raising, training. Change doesn't usually start in your wallet. It doesn't start with, ah, oh, how much does it cost? But often change starts with becoming aware of something. Uh, learning something. So it changed that in people's heads, basically. So with the tambourine, we want to make people more interested, uh, motivate them, inform them, train them uh, to make this change going faster. And in the past, until a couple of years ago, the picture looked at this, and then I added the skateboard. Because obviously, especially when we think about the industrial energy transition, we need innovation. <laughs> For the heat energy transition, I would say many of the things are there. Of course, they need to be improved and they need to get cheaper and more convenient and more many things and better rolled out and many better digitalized. But in the industrial energy transition, of course, we have still some processes where we basically don't have a lot of answers yet. Uh, and in general, innovation will make our donkey move a lot of faster. So what does this mean in practice? Here are some of our policies. So about the stick, I will talk later, the banning of oil and gas heating. I have a slide on that. We provide subsidies. Um, uh, maximum in a home 11 and now since a week ago, 13,000 uh, euro as investment subsidies for the replacement of uh, a fossil fuel boiler by uh, renewables in different stages. And it's a combined 
federal and regional funding. Then uh, we have uh, these energy advice service where people uh, can call us and the energy advisor comes for free to people's homes, which is uh, really, really good, especially when you, we don't need it when it's a new build because there's nothing to see. But when it's a renovation, usually it concerns the heating system, it concerns the building envelope, the windows. Uh, there are usually many things that you can much better see on site. So this is a, a core element. Then we run training, uh, a large campaign. I will talk about this in a moment. Uh, we have training programs and we also have innovation and market development. Uh, I run uh, a, a very large business network, the Clean Tech Cluster Energy, in which I network companies um, that offer products and services. So these are some examples uh, of our policies. So you saw my number earlier, 60% renewable heating. So basically we are really doing better than most people in the rest of Europe. So that's for sure. Um, uh, but of course we live in different times, even before the current crisis. So it is very clear that a lot remains to be done. And what the crisis has brought to us, this needs to happen a lot faster. So this whole, and I think this is also uh, something for the research community. How can it help us to do this transition faster? Uh, and uh, that is one of the elements that we still have to really grapple with. So because obviously we have climate neutrality in Europe by 2050, Austria um, has the target to be already climate neutral by 2040, which is ambitious, <laughs> but uh, this is the political target. And that means we have really to speed up uh, we, on all fronts. So uh, here's maybe, here's a bit of information on some of our programs. So here is um, quality. Um, I, I first wondered whether Switzerland being known for its quality, whether I should add a slide on quality, but then I thought, well, <laughs> it is important. So we have very strict emissions, emission and efficiency criteria in our funding programs. So for heat pumps, performance requirement based on a seasonal efficiency calculation, noise, lim noise limits for air source heat pumps. Uh, the industry was not very happy when we introduced this at the beginning, but we got so many complaints uh, in summer uh, because people put the heat pump at the farthest away possible from their own building at the border to the neighbor. And then if it's not a good heat pump, it was noisy. Uh, so we have now these noise limits and now it's, I think, a good example how a problem can go away with good policy making. Uh, then, of course, we have um, increasingly strict uh, requirements on the global warming potential, um, depending on the situation between uh, 1500 and 2000. And in the funding programs, we also require a green electricity and Ökostrom Vertrag um, in order for the, for the heat pump to be eligible for funding. If you want to call this district heating in this renewable district heating, 80% has to come from renewables, high efficiency CHP or waste heat. And uh, in, the, in the EU, uh, we also have these very demanding uh, requirements on all operators of district heating on decarbonizing uh, their heat production. So that is a parallel process that is, keeps them quite on their toes. And then uh, here the example for pellet boilers. We do have, um, and we, this became stricter and stricter over the last years. So we have the emission standard of the Austrian eco label. So this is some of the quality criteria uh, for our funding programs, but um, I don't know whether the debate uh, about um, 
bioenergy being renewables has also reached the Swiss media. Uh, I, I got out two slides which I haven't used in Europe since a long time. Uh, I, I developed it for the US because uh, there I helped a lot of uh, US states developing heating markets. So um, these are pretty obvious things, but in times like this, I think it's good in terms of quality to remind people why do we think modern and clean wood heating is a good idea. Uh, it serves when well done our en environmental and climate goals. It supports and not harms sustainable forestry. It creates new business opportunities and local jobs. It su does support energy independence and it is a good heating options for the right buildings. And of course, this comes with some conditions and the conditions are sustainable forestry, meaning uh, 20 to 25 percent of the residues remain in the forest, that the for the fuel production we only use residues along the chain and we organize this in an effective way and we use highly efficient and lowest emission heating equipment. So these are the framework conditions under which we know that uh, biomass heating is a good solution, especially in older buildings where you have you don't have a low energy a low temperature heat distribution system. So um, and here is the number. The heat pump is about the same. This is uh, last year's. Um, now here you can see the investment. Um, 1.5 million people. So pellet heating alone is about 100 million euro a year. So um, it's not a big industry, but it is an industry that is relevant. Uh, in order to make the energy transition happen and to reach climate neutrality, Austria uh, is putting uh, expiry dates, Ablaufdatum, uh, to fossil fuel heating. So um, we banned already uh, fossil fuel heating in new construction. I mean, you would be, until the current crisis, I would, would have said you need to be crazy to put fossil fuel uh, oil heating in new construction. Um, well, uh, time is changing. And starting from this should be 2023, sorry. Um, there will be no replacement of broken oil boilers. And then starting from 25 or 26, uh, all, all, all 25 year old boilers. So there will be a stage plan. So these data I have, I need to update them uh, because this is still in its final decision making, but you get my thrift. So old oil boilers must be replaced. And then 2035, there will be no more oil heating. So this is very clear. And this has been communicated to the market since 2018. So people understand fossil fuel, oil heating is coming to an end. Uh, many people say it's forbidden. It is not forbidden yet, but um, it's like plastic bag. People used to say they are forbidden long before they were actually forbidden. And at the moment, there's an intense political process. What the timetable for gas will be? There will be a timetable for gas. Uh, it's a bit more complicated, especially in big cities. Uh, but uh, luckily, this concerns mostly Vienna. Um, so it's not our biggest problem, uh, but there will be the staged phase out plan. And it's it, it, people understand it and it didn't need the current crisis to arrive. Um, we have these funding programs, and this is important because if you uh, next year, if uh, we stop a family home that has been heated with oil, the boiler breaks, uh, the, the authority says this has to be taken out. And what if they cannot afford a new oil boiler, a new, any new heating system? Uh, so we need a solution for that politically. Otherwise, uh, and the solution uh, is uh, this program, Sauberheitsen für alle, 
uh, clean heating for everyone, sauber heizen für alle, where we offer 100% funding for low income households. So this has been running since January. You can imagine the demand in the last weeks has been really big. Uh, the income thresholds are uh, not very low. So they are slightly above other slightly other above income thresholds that, for example, we have an income threshold which is about 1100 for many other things with which you are officially poor to use this nasty word, um, a low income household. Ours are somewhat higher. Um, and for two or three persons, these are not that rarely uh, families where only one pa parent works and there is a second parent and one or two children. So they would, and this is this person doesn't have a very big income, they are often eligible. So uh, they need to own the house. So this is the first stage. Other stages are following now and we fund 100% uh, with certain maximum values. The switch from oil, gas, coal, direct electric to uh, bioenergy heat pump, renewable district heating. So this has been a very important uh, program. And of course, uh, we, we are so glad that we already have it in the current situation. So here is um, a short slide, it's in German, sorry, um, of the current discussions we have. Uh, so the, the heat, the Wärmewende is not what it was a year ago. Uh, so we do have an extremely high demand uh, for products and services. And this already started with the first lockdown. People were at home, they were bored, they had money left over because they couldn't go on holidays. So they thought, okay, we have cleaned out the attic and now we finally tackled this stupid old oil or gas heating system. So we could feel it actually it started two weeks in the first lockdown. The phone started ringing saying, oh, no, no. Um, and then of course, this went through the lockdowns. Uh, and also in general, when people are home, it was one of these investments that increased in the past two years of Corona, like furniture and pools and also heating systems. Then of course, we had the start of the price increase in the fourth quarter last year. So this hasn't really started with uh, the Ukraine war. And then of course now, is this um, a challenging time? We will see new social challenges. We, we don't really know yet where, where this will go and how we, uh, there are programs of course in Austria, uh, funding, first funding has paid, been paid out to everyone, but what it will really mean, we don't know. We need to deal with this high demand and communicate in the right way. So for example, what I see, so I will say, yes, you will have to wait for your heating installer, but next year you will also have to wait. So better start waiting now. People understand this. They understand when they say, you know, you, look at the world what it is like can you imagine your heating installer is busy oh yeah right so this is a big part of this is a communication strategy uh, um and then we have to tell people this winter it's too late uh, but start preparing think well we also need to get a lot better digitalizing this whole heat transition so if you look what the heating installer does today, practically, wow, is this an undigitalized process. <laughs> he goes there, he measures the boiler room. He, so the, we are at the beginning of a process in a relatively innovation resistant sector. And now we have a window of opportunity. And what we see now with the Ukraine crisis, that efficiency is a key part of the solution of the heat energy transition. So nothing very new for us, but still in the past years when the focus was so much on renewables, which is good, 
people did forget energy efficiency in buildings and in industry. So a few words about our campaign. You can see it also behind me. Ganz Oberösterreich sagt adieu. We started that already in 2019. Um, and you can see the oil barrel is kind of <laughs> disappearing. Jetzt raus mit den Ölheizungen. Why did we talk about oil? 18% is not a lot. I hear it a lot in European conferences. Uh, yeah, but gas is the big thing. Yes, maybe quantitatively, but even for us, these 18% are 45% of our building CO2. So oil does count. And it does also count in countries where maybe it's only a few percent. But I learned that actually Switzerland <laughs> is one of the countries. <laughs> and I googled this, so this map is uh, with a relatively high share of oil heating. So in a way, you are lucky. Uh, because it's much easier to replace than gas heating. Technically, you have the space, you have the mindset of the people. So in that sense, it's an easier situation as if you have a lot of gas heating in terms of the technical transition. And you see there are many countries in Europe where oil heating is not a big deal. Nevertheless, oil heating in the EU is 17 million. This equals the CO to complete CO2 emissions of the Netherlands. So that's why oil heating is a big problem and it needs to be tackled as fast as possible. So we ran this campaign uh, with a different kind of messaging because we did market segmentation. And I think you, Martin Patel, you said you are not a, in, from the engineering faculty, but often to engineers, market segmentation is an alien concept. So what is market segmentation? Not everybody is the same. Not homeowner. The homeowners are different. You have the famous early adopter to late adopter curve, and this needs to be taken into account. Not everyone is the same. So we did market segmentation and clearly in, in my region, if you still have an oil heating system, you are a mid to late adopter because all early, it's gone. So, and first and second, so this was 2019, the two main arguments didn't work for you, which were, we give you a lot of public funding and it's bad for the environment. These two things didn't work for this group because if they had worked, they would have done it. So we developed a new kind of messaging and uh, the key element is, and often these are not younger people, but people, let's say 60 plus. And a key message was oil heating is not modern anymore. And young people will be surprised, but you can't be old enough to not to be unmodern. No one wants to be unmodern. Uh, this is something I've learned. And so there is a kind of sentiment in society now. Das macht man heute nicht, is what we would say in German. So, and we say, you know, it's not modern, it's dying out. It's time to say goodbye. I, my first idea for the slogan was, it's time to say goodbye, uh, but it ex was a too expensive slogan. Changing is simpler than you think. This is kind of half true, <laughs> or, or if I'm honest. It does take some steps, but it, again, it's not rocket science, and it pays off for you, for the economy, and at the end, for the environment. We also use the picture, uh, what you need, uh, you can see this maybe here. No, you can't. This is just some in images. The oil you need to heating, heat one home for one winter, you can drive a car around the world. 44,000 kilometers is what, what the cake. And this is not even an inefficient home. So people kind of got, wow, this is a lot. So these are the kind of messages we used. 
And to come to the end, so it's good to speak about all benefits, to do market segmentation. Whom are you talking to? How can you reach men? And where do pellets work better and where do heat pumps work better? A value chain approach is important. And if you do policy or policy advocacy, uh, combination carrot sticks, tambourine skateboards, and megaphones work. So this is just the number of last year's pro. Actually, it's this should be 22. It's last year's program. So you see the homeowners that we funded. So this year the gas segment will be a lot bigger. So this was 2021. So it's the people that decided in 2020. And you see, we always have this roughly 60, 30, 10 uh, equation for existing building. And to come to the end, two short promotional sentences, we run the European Energy Efficiency Conference, uh, uh, which is held in the context of the World Sustainable Energy Days. Austria is actually not so far away <laughs> from Switzerland, and it does have a range of policies. We have a natural energy conference, we have a policy conference, and we have a young energy researchers conference. So, and the deadline is the 10th of October. So uh, I, I invite all the researchers that are here. This is a really great opportunity for young researcher. You must be under 35. And you are typical, these are PhD students, young postdocs or very good master students. And they get to spend an immor Im a very uh, a week with a lot of big memories and a lot of learning in our conference. We cover the cost for accommodation, meal and participation. And it's a truly global conference. So we have people from all continents. So it's a unique uh, learning opportunities. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. I have a good question. Do we need wood as a resource for building and chemistry? Yes. I think, uh, I know that this is um, a narrative, I think a political narrative that has its sources and in a small group, pressure group of environmental NGOs. You don't know me, but I'm the last person who is a persecution mania. I usually say, ah, oh, this is rubbish. But I've really looked into this and it's true. We have to be more careful with the residues. But at the moment, if you look at forestry, what, what do you think that we do with all the little thinnings? There is no use for this at the moment. There is, uh, there is a competition and this is true, but this is not new for the, so from the sawmill residues, the sawdust. Uh, because the particle board industry always was in competition and they were very upset when pellet heating came because they used to be a monopoly and suddenly they had competition. So it is true, we will have to be more efficient and maybe in 30 years, this is maybe the investment circle for heating systems, the answer will look different. But with the buildings we have today and with the electricity generation structure we have today, this is a trade-off between direct electric heating in winter, because in, in countries, I don't know what the situation is in Switzerland, but in Austria, in winter when we need the heating, uh, renewable electricity is lowest because the rivers are lowest. I'm sure this is fairly similar in Switzerland. Uh, and of course, PV doesn't help and we don't have a lot of wind, which does help in winter. So in winter, where we have the dirtiest electricity and we need to import it from outside Austria, usually not from clean sources. If the day comes when really the European electricity grid is fully clean, then we need to reevaluate this question. But at the moment, I would say for the next 30 years, the trade-off of the different solution goes very clearly. And of course, with making our buildings more and more efficient, we need less heating. 
So we can see already that the, in the last 20 years, roughly the amount of additional heating systems we installed, and you can see them here on the slide, needed roughly similar amounts of resources because at the same time, the buildings got more and more efficient. It's true if we add a lot of demand from large consumers like industry, the picture looks uh, slightly different. Yeah, I have two more questions. And the role of solar thermal. Yes, uh, we were the leading solar thermal region in Europe. <laughs> we had the highest per capita installed uh, solar thermal systems. But as here and also in Switzerland, I remember 20 years ago, it was a big deal. Unfortunately, it was a case of uh, radio killed the video star, video killed the radio star, PV killed solar thermal. It was, it, the markets just went to something that it found more interesting. Uh, it's a pity, <laughs> but that's how it was. And also with the decrease of costs of PV, the pictures changed. It's quite possible with the current developments that the solar thermal will be back. And I would be more than happy to have a bigger role of solar thermal, maybe in district heating, maybe in um, applications that we had already, but kind of people lost interest. So at the moment, the role is small. The, the solar thermal plants we built in uh, the 90s and the, in, until 25, 10, they're still there, they're working well, so maybe this is going to get bigger. Question about the air quality. Now, um, because I, I had this as a backup, I didn't, um, uh, I'll show it to you um, here. So you can see here, you saw the increase, of biomass heating, and you can see here the NOx and the PM emissions. So uh, this is obviously when we talk about bioenergy, we talk about modern, fully automated appliances using standard fuels. We are not talking about Lagerfeuer in einer Kiste. <laughs> uh, we are not very fond of uh, often a Kamin and all these kind of things. Um, stoves, very modern stoves can be wonderful, but cheap stoves from the Bauhaus are something we advise against. Uh, so uh, what you can see here that these are the two, two most critical emissions, they went down. Uh, and so actually the contribution of modern bioenergy to air pollution has been proven that there is not a link. So uh, despite many uh, communications on the contrary. <laughs>